All right. So let me just remind you what we uh, did the last time. We export a question. If we have two operators, A and B, right, corresponding to two properties, say position and momentum, right? And then we ask the question whether uh, a system described by a function psi, if we measure property corresponding to A and uh, property corresponding to B, whether one wave function can be an eigenfunction for these two operators at the same time, right? Because if the answer to that question is positive, it can be, then, then uh, essentially we can measure property N and property B with certainty. So there will be a certain value which is given by an eigenvalue. Right, and so if psi is a simultaneous eigenfunction for both a and b, then the results of the experiment on measuring a and b will be these two numbers, small a and small b, the eigenvalues corresponding to that eigenfunction. Right, and this can be extended even further. If there is operator C, D, right, uh, and this operator, this, this function of ours is an eigenfunction of the C, D, A, and B, then we can measure all these properties at the same time together, right? But you probably heard already that in quantum mechanics, say position and momentum, those are the two quantities that cannot be measured together at the same time with certainty. Well, first, it takes some time to understand what this statement means, because it's confusing. What sometimes people say is, OK, you have a wave function, you measure position, then you change the momentum. right? So you may have heard such statement, which is completely wrong. Because when we talk about simultaneous measurement of A and B, we can do very clean experiment where we make two copies of the system, right? Two copies with identical wave function, right? So we have uh, one glass with a wave function psi and another glass with a wave function psi, right? Yeah, completely identical glasses. And then you can measure position in one and momentum in another. And those measurements will be completely independent. Right? So whatever happens when we measure position in glass number one will not affect when we measure the momentum in glass number two. Right? So those are two completely different measurements. Now the question is whether they are, uh, like these measurements will give us certain results in the sense that if we repeat those measurements, again, making another two copies. Right? So we will never try to measure the same thing over and over on the system uh, that is given to us, we will make as many copies as we want so that the experiment will be clean. We will not affect the result of the experiment by the previous measurement, right? So we will always make the system, the example of the system, so like, say, psi, 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 and as many copies as we want, right? So here we measure position, here we measure momentum, and here we measure again position, and then so on and so forth. We start measuring the pairs. And the question is, these results, uh, when they give the same answer, x1, x1, right, reproducibly, no matter how many times we measure, that would indicate that we, with our psi function, we are in the situation where psi is an eigenfunction of the position, right? That's why. No matter how many times we will measure position on that wave function, we will always get the same answer. And that answer will correspond to eigenvalue. On the other hand, if the wave function psi is not an eigenfunction of x, we will keep getting different answers in those measurements. The same with the momentum. So these measurements, they do not affect each other. The question is. If for the position we got the same answer, 
can we get the same answers for the momentum? All right, so reproducibly the same answers. And the answer to that question is no, we cannot for a simple reason that if we are considering A equals position and B equals momentum, right, these two operators cannot have the same eigenfunction. Okay? So there, it, uh, there is no function psi that would be eigenfunction of the position and eigenfunction of the momentum at the same time. So right, so there is no psi which does that. It doesn't exist. And how do I know this? Last time we proved the simple theorem that for this to happen, all we need is not to look for this function, but all we need is to consider the commutator of a and b. Right? So that was a b minus b a applied to any random function when we, this is just another operator essentially, right? Applied to any random function f, does it give zero or not? If applied to any random function f it gives zero, we can say that two operators commute and the conclusion of the theorem that we proved was that then these two operators can have the same eigenfunctions. Can have, so that in some cases you need to choose them properly. And we saw the case of momentum and the kinetic energy which commute, but not necessarily any random eigenfunctions of one operator will be an eigenfunction of another operator. Uh, but now, if they don't commute, so you calculate this commutator applied to a random function f, and the answer is not zero, then in that situation, a and b cannot be uh, having eigenfunctions which are eigenfunctions of the A and then the B at the same time. And we calculated last time the commutator of X and P. It was I bar I, I times H bar, X, P, I, H bar, plus or minus, depends on how you arrange it. Um, so I guessed it right, so X comma p gives the i h bar. If you go p comma h, uh, x, then it's minus i h bar. Okay, so any questions about that? Because this is another very important point. First of all, you need to understand what do we mean when we say we can measure property with certainty. All right, so what does that really mean? And then of course, you need to understand how the commutation of two operators is related to the property that you can measure two quantities corresponding to these two operators simultaneously with certainty. So those are somewhat confusing questions because, because simply that in quantum mechanics, when we do measurement, we are disturbing the system. Okay, so one point to always uh, kind of think about is that in order to avoid this disturbance you can create infinitely many uh, copies of the system and do individual measurements on those copies and certainty means that on all identical copies you get identical results always right so that's certainty that's what people mean by certain outcome of the measurement uncertain outcome is when you not only know probabilities corresponding again to getting eigenvalues of the operators, you always get eigenvalues of operators. But which ones, you don't know with certainty, with 100%. You know with some, uh, some mm, probability, but not with 100% probability. And then the question of simultaneous measurement is whether you can have a system where you can predict the result of the measurement of two operators on two different copies, say, with 100% each, right? So if there are no other questions, we can move on. So someone asked me, okay, so what's the, what's the value of knowing what the commutator is, right, right, right after lecture, and so, Today, I guess I will illustrate that point more because it turns out that 
this quantity can be used for the quantitative uh, estimate of uh, uncertainty, general uncertainty. Because if we take any two random operator A and B, then generally they do not commute. Generally, this is not always zero, like with numbers. With numbers, generally, if you multiply two numbers like this or like that, you get the same answer, right? 5 times 3 or 3 times 5, it's 15. And so commutators of numbers, always zero. Commutators of operators, generally, is not zero. You can find such operators that will give you non-zero, uh, zero result. But generally, the result is non-zero. It's like on the plane, generally, any two lines intersect, unless you have a special case of parallel lines, right? So that's the same thing with operators. Generally, they do not commute. You can find specific operators which commute, but generally they don't. Like lines generally intersect in the 2D space. Generally, lines do not intersect in 3D space, right? Because in 3D space, there's more space, right, for them to avoid each other. OK, so that's what I mean by generally. Uh, now, we talked about the spread of measurements when we study the measurement of one operator, right? So there is this standard deviation corresponding to, say, measurement of property A, if we have an operator A, right? And we are considering a wave function that is not eigenfunction, um, say, of the A operator, right? So then we have a standard deviation from average because Potentially, we can calculate average by doing this, right? That was our average. And um, yeah, let me put the big R. Hey. All right, so this guy is, we showed that it's the F, this quantity I will. Um, I uh, will write either like this, or like this, or like that. So all three uh, ways of writing average can be used. Now, what is standard deviation? We showed that it actually can be written as you square the operator, you calculate its average, right? And you subtract the square of the average. That was the definition of what square, uh, square of the standard deviation is. Also, it's known as variance. OK? And so the standard deviation was uh, defined as a square root of that variance quantity. OK? Usually, in, uh, in exams, I will clarify what do I want, this quantity or that quantity. So, And there is an easy uh, transformation between those. Right? Now, what is this important for is just I would like to remind you that if we have a wave function that is an eigenfunction of the operator, right? so for this case, then the standard deviation is always zero. Why? Well, the algebra is pretty simple. And I think we even done it once. Because if this is the case, then the average is equal to corresponding eigenvalue because you can write this simply like this. This will give you like this. And then A can be taken outside. And essentially, you get psi psi. Considering the wave function, which is normalized, then you get small a. If a wave function is not normalized, then I wouldn't write average like that. I would write average with the denominator. Uh, that contained psi, and then there would be a cancellation. So 
at any rate, average will be just an eigenvalue. And then this kind of if I want to calculate the standard deviation, I need the average of the square of the operator, and that is psi a square psi. Okay, so this means I apply a twice, and uh, that just gives me two small a, so it's a small a squared, and by the same logic, it's like this, and this is one for the case we're considering. And so then, if we calculate this quantity, then it will be minus, which is a square minus a square, zero, right? So variance will be zero, and the standard deviation also will be zero. And naturally, if you have an eigen function, then if you do the measurement, the average value that you get is a, and there will be no deviation from a. Okay? So it's always going to be the same answer. Now, this is all useful for now defining or introducing this uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which was already stated, but there is a kind of a more mathematical um, Heisenberg uncertainty principle. All right, so there is more mathematical uh, and more restricted statement about sigma x, sigma p, higher or equal than h bar divided by 2. You guys have some questions? Huh? No, you don't? OK. Good. So because if you do, please ask. Um, all right, so this is the statement. And you may wonder, where does this come from? And what does it mean? Well, we already discussed that position and momentum, they don't commute. That means no matter uh, what function psi do we take, right? It's not going to be an eigenfunction of the position and momentum at the same time, right? So that means we will always, for any function psi, we will always have non-zero standard deviation for position or for momentum, or for both, right? Is that clear? No? Yes? Should I explain? <laughs> okay, so if the function is not an eigenfunction of uh, an operator, then there is a standard deviation, all right, uh, which is non-zero. So the zero, zero variance or zero standard deviation only happens if you have a wave function that is an uh, eigenfunction. Now, if there is no such function, there is no such, this function doesn't exist, so that, so that that eigenfunction is uh, eigenfunction of the position and momentum at the same time, that means that either deviation of uh, standard deviation of x with this function or standard deviation of p with that function is non-zero, or maybe both are non-zero, right? Because it may be not an eigenfunction for both x and p. It may be eigenfunction for one of them, but not for both, right? So that means sigma x and sigma p, uh, they, uh, they, will <coughs> they will be, uh, one of them will be definitely non-zero, OK? Good. Well, it's a good point. Uh, the, <laughs> the idea here is that actually, if you look closer, first of all, 
while the eigenfunctions of the position and momenta, they are not really L-square integrable functions. That's one problem with them. So real systems, they will never be eigenfunctions of, uh, for the real system, you'll never get to the eigenfunction of position or momentum. And the second thing is that if you have an uh, uh, eigenfunction, which is, uh, ev even if you consider you know, L non-square integrable eigenfunction of the position, then the standard deviation of the momentum actually can go to infinity, right? And so you have uh, some kind of a product of zero times infinity. Uh, how do you consider that? That, that may have still a uh, finite value. But for realistic systems, uh, both of them are non-zero. And so then that non-zero times non-zero is always will be higher than h bar divided by 2. Okay, so that's the kind of uh, resolution of your paradox. Okay. That's right. That's, that's one point. And uh, second, you can consider the situations where one goes to zero, then another will go to infinity. And uh, if you properly mathematically consider that limit, you will end up with uh, the product being still higher or equal than uh, h bar divided by 2. OK. So h bar is a reduced, yeah. Uh, that's a resolution of the paradox that uh, Corey just formulated because uh, the, the, the paradox is the following. So what if we find an eigen, uh, the psi, which is an eigenfunction of x, say, or the p, right? So then one of them will be 0, and 0 multiplied by any f constant finite uh, value of another uh, will give us 0. So 0 cannot be more or equal than the h bar divided by 2, which is some positive value, small but positive. So that seems like making this expression incorrect if we are taking the uh, eigenfunction of the one of these quantities. Right? Mm -hmm. OK, so now <coughs> this is clear. Uh, and how, how this can be derived, uh, I'm not going to go into the derivation of this expression. Rather, I will just illustrate more general expression for any arbitrary two operators. So say if you have A and B again, sigma A squared, sigma B squared will always be higher or equal to minus 1 quarter. And here, integral of psi a b psi dx okay and this integral must be squared so there is this statement. And if you put in this statement commutator of x and p that we already calculated, right? then x and p commutator was i h bar. right? So the integral of the psi is just 1. So whatever well, well you have psi star. Uh, x p right inside psi d x and that will be i h bar psi star psi d x right so then this is just i h bar then if you square this 
like this expression requires you, you get minus h bar squared. And if you add 1 quarter, so that will be minus h bar squared divided by 4 with another minus from here, right? So that quantity is h bar squared divided by 4 because minus and minus cancel each other. And um, note that here we're talking about variances. Here we're talking about standard deviation, so you need a square root. So if you take a square root of this quantity, then you get h bar, uh, h bar without square divided by 2, right? And that is exactly the expression for that we were talking before about. Now, how do we derive something like this? Actually, it's, um, it's not that difficult. And uh, I decided this time just to illustrate this because it's a really nice mathematical trick. So, and kind of will introduce you to interesting construction. You know, like these geometrical problems where they, you, you're given a problem and you need to add more lines to, to prove something, right? So here, here what we're going to do in order to prove this statement, this one, okay? Uh, what we're going to do is the following. We're going to consider an operator which is delta A, and I'll explain what delta is, plus I lambda delta B multiplied by delta A minus I lambda delta b uh, without square. So what is delta a? It's the a operator minus average of a operator. So essentially it's an operator minus its uh, average with the wave function psi that uh, is some kind of it's the same psi that we have here that we consider. We have always function psi for the system. Now delta b is b operator minus average of the b on that function psi. Okay? So these are delta a and delta b operators. Now what this operator is, it's actually the absolute value, if you think about it, because this and this are conjugated quantities with respect to each other. So we can just write that we are considering this type of operator, absolute square. Okay? So that's our operator, pretty complicated, may seem. Now, we can call it C, and it depends on lambda, which is a parameter. So lambda is fixed, but we can vary it. Uh, it's fixed uh, when we say take integrals, but uh, once uh, once the integrals are taken, we can we can vary the lambda. Lambda is parameter. Okay. So now, what do we know about operator C? Is that uh, well, this quantity, if we average it it's always going to be positive because the operator itself is a positive quantity. It's an uh, absolute square. And the function, well, it's taken like an average, right? And so this is always going to be, as a function of lambda, more or equal than 0. So no matter what lambda you choose, this average is going to be always more than 0. And that's a crucial part of the proof that we formulated some operator which is a mix of two 
And we can vary lambda any way we want. And we'll, our average is always going to be average of the total operator C, always going to be higher than 0. Now, what we would like to do is using that, uh, using that fact that this cannot go below 0, we will minimize this quantity with respect to lambda. Okay, how do we minimize? This is pretty much like a function with respect to lambda, right? Because lambda is just one parameter inside of this complicated expression where we need to take the integral with the wave functions for this operator that, that contains the averages over function solves. It looks complicated, but in reality, it's just a function of one variable. How do we choose? How do we find the minimum of the function? We take a derivative, right? And we equal it to what? One, two, three. Do you guys know how to take to obtain the minima of the functions? Huh? That's right, zero. So if, say, we name this as a function of lambda, then in order to find the minimum, we differentiate and take and equal it to zero, right? So how do we differentiate this expression? Well, it's pretty straightforward because well, we have lambda there, and uh, we do not integrate over lambda. So the differentiation of all these integrals is just go and differentiate the integrand, right? So the, the expression we need to deal with is uh, averaging of a plus i lambda delta b delta minus i lambda delta b averaging, right? And so we want to differentiate that with respect to lambda. And we say that this is 0 so that we can find lambda corresponding to the minimum, OK? Now, first, let's consider what this uh, operator is if we just multiply delta a plus i lambda with delta a minus i lambda, right? So that would be delta a squared, OK? Uh, first, say this two, uh, the delta a, delta a, that's delta a squared, this two will give us uh, plus lambda squared delta b squared. And the appearance of delta a and delta b squared, it's very important because these guys, they are averages of delta a squared, essentially, right? Because uh, the stand, uh, variance, or square of the standard deviation is average of uh, a operator minus a average squared, right? So that's, so that's what variance is. And so appearance of delta a squared, which is this quantity, this operator, is very useful. That means we're going somewhere. We're going to build up the expression that we want. So we have this from these two terms, and then the cross terms will be plus i lambda. And here, we will have product of i lambda delta b delta a, and the product where we have delta a multiplied by minus i lambda delta b. So the order of delta a and delta b will be different into terms. So that's why we are getting the commutator, delta b, delta a. OK? It's like, essentially, you have a plus b squared, right? What is this? If the a and b are numbers, this is a squared plus b squared plus 2ab. 
Now imagine A and B, A times B is not equal to B times A, right? Because we are dealing with commutator, uh, with sorry, with the operators, right? So if A B is not equal B A, then A plus B squared is gonna be A squared plus B squared plus A B plus B A, right? Now if you well, if you substitute this by having say plus i b and then instead of a square you take the absolute square then you end up with something like i a b minus b a okay and with numbers this term will just disappear because a b equals b a with commutators it won't disappear and it will give you or with operators i keep saying commutators and with uh, operators, it will give the commutator of A and B, right? So that's what we got here. Now, interestingly, commutator of delta B, delta A, is the same as a commutator of B, A. Why is that? Oh, simply because numbers commute, right? And the difference between delta A and A is this number, which is average of A. Right? So you can really do, go home and do the algebra, write all the four terms, because this contains two terms, this contains two terms, you write down what the commutator is, actually you will get more than four terms, but uh, eventually you will see, there will be four commutators probably, and uh, only one of them will be non-zero because the commutator of the number with the operator is zero. The commutator of two numbers is zero. So that's why the commutator of delta B and delta A is the same as commutator B and A. Okay? So, all right. Now we can differentiate this with respect to lambda because essentially we have a quadratic function, right? Lambda is squared here, lambda is linear here. So when we differentiate, what do we get? All right, so we will lose the delta A squared because it doesn't have lambda. So we got two lambda uh, and then delta b squared. This is all average still. Average didn't go anywhere. I here we lose lambda and we substitute the commutator by b a commutator and average and this is equal to zero by condition that we want this derivative to be zero. And from that, we can find that lambda minimum, the lambda that minimizes that whole average, brings it as close to zero as possible. Right? This lambda minimum will be i. You can just uh, do simple algebra here. Uh, inverse signs because BA is minus AB, right? That comes handy. And um, we have lambda minimum, which is just a ratio. You can see from where, where this ratio, where does it come from, right? So we got lambda minimum. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna put in our expression, this lambda minimum, uh, mainly to kind of minimize as much as possible the uncertainty, okay? So this is kind of a minimization process. The idea is to minimize the uncertainty as much as possible for two operators which do not commute generally, all right? And then, all then this expression will be equal to we'll plug in the lambda minimum into 
essentially this expression here I already wrote. And it will be delta A squared plus we had before lambda squared, delta B squared, right? Delta B squared and lambda now squared is this expression with I means it's minus, uh, let me write it down in the full. There will be some cancellation. You can see it already, delta B squared here in the numerator, delta B squared average in denominator. And so this whole thing is squared. plus I lambda, which means we have this. Okay, so this is lambda introduced and then we have a commutator BA. And this all ends up with averaging. Okay? Now, what we can do, this is just number, right? So this is just a number. So we can actually take an average of the operators and make the consolation of numbers that we're going to get. So first, we're going to get the uh, average of delta A squared. Then average of sum is the sum of averages, right? So that's why then we can obtain delta B squared um, multiplied by this number uh, I average of the AB to delta B so squared plus uh, I times I can give us minus right away and we have a B B squared average of B A Okay. Now you can see that A, B, and B, A, if you change this to A, B, then you have a right to change that sign to plus because commutator of B, A is minus the A, B commutator, right? So you change the sign here and you change the sign here twice, it's okay. Now, and that means you have a now it means you have actually a square of the average of the commutator, right? The numerator, you have a delta B squared, uh, and then I, you don't pay attention because I forgot here too, right? Because our lambda was defined with the two in the denominator. All right, so we have this last term Second term, first term. Okay, now this is squared means that we can square here. And I was there, so we can change the sign. Now it's squared. And we have a square of average of uh, delta B squared. This two goes to four. And now we can cancel the square and denominator. You can already see there's some interesting pattern uh, appears here because uh, well these two terms are they have the same structure right now they have the same numerator square of average of the commutator divided by delta b squared average right and then here we have a four 
the denominator here we have 2 and the signs are different so it's essentially minus 1 fourth plus 1 half and that will give us positive 1 fourth and this value is always positive so the total thing is positive more than 0 by our initial assumption or our initial kind of condition and so from this what we can do is we can take this to the left to the which side uh, no we keep this on on the on the on this side we will take all the commutators to the right side and the total expression will be very close to what we wanted to achieve at the end because that will be delta A squared, right? And then it's more or equal than we take the rest to the other side and it's with minus one fourth and we have here average of A B squared divided by delta B squared average right so all I did I took these two terms to the right hand side and I also well these terms are similar so I did the algebra and got got rid of one of them for that I need I needed to put one fourth with the right sign and so now I can take this guy and multiply it here on the left hand side by the way as I was pointing before this is uh, variance of A this is variance of B right so what we got is variance of A squared variance of B squared more or equal one fourth of the average A B squared that's what we got and this is exactly the expression which I put in the beginning okay so that's the end of the magic act All right because essentially there the average uh, here the average was explicitly written as an integral of, with the function their average is just a uh, angular brackets right but now going back to your question actually the original expression with uh, the original expression for uncertainty principle which was written right was like this and uh, it's uh, Essentially, it raises this question that you, you asked, right? So what if our function psi is a function which is an eigenfunction, say, position, okay? And it's zero times something which could be infinity. And uh, we can, of course, make excuses that the, uh, for the physical system, we don't have a, really the position eigenfunction. But in reality, now, if you look at this expression, okay, this expression shows us that if one of the one like if we choose a wave function, which is an eigenfunction of a and or b, then this term is not going to be h bar divided by two. This term will be just zero. Okay. I kind of forgot about this little thing. Uh, why is this term will be zero? Uh, it's kind of easy to show through simple algebra, uh, which will be useful for us in our next topic, time dynamics. But for now, let's assume that just using A and B, right? Say let's assume, let's assume that psi is an eigenfunction of a, 
right? Let's assume this. So then this guy will be 0 because those are two operators. And we can always pick operators, uh, say, Hamiltonian. Then for the Hamiltonian, we can always have a um, function for the physical system, which is an eigenfunction, right? So for position, maybe we cannot. That's kind of uh, constrained. But for different operators, we can. So let's say we pick this function. Then this will be 0. B can be an operator which uh, then for which the psi is not an eigenfunction, common thing. Say, if we have uh, H for a particle in the box as A operator and uh, momentum as a B operator, then we know that functions like sine and pi x divided by L, square root of 2 divided by L, right? So they are eigenfunctions of H. And they're not eigenfunctions of p, right? So then, but you can, you will do that in the midterm or in the homeworks. Uh, you will calculate what will be the variance for the operator p for those functions, and you will see that it's not zero. Okay. So now you have zero times non-zero, but not infinity, right? So this will be zero, right? Now, the question is, do we get 0 here? And the answer is yes, we're going to get 0 here too, because uh, simply the expression we need to consider is this commutator, the, uh, the average, right, dx of the commutator. And this is AB minus BA. And so what this term will give us, well, let's say we consider this minus the integral of uh, psi uh, ba, right? right? Two integrals. You guys follow? Because operator as a minus sign we have two integrals now this integral is easy we know that psi a psi is small a psi right so we have for this guy we have just psi star b psi and small a outside right average of Essentially, we have average of b times small a. Now, I will prove that this guy gives exactly the same. And then they cancel each other. So how do I prove this? Uh, what I need here is a notion of so-called Hermitian operator. Okay, so without that, kind of hard to prove this statement. And uh, it turns out, it turns out that the operators that we are dealing with in quantum mechanics, they are all so-called Hermitian operators. And what does this mean? I will explain right now. So. Let's say we consider something, something like this, right? Very general integral where we have an operator acting on one function, and we integrate this with another function. It's as general as you can imagine, because the functions can be different. Functions can be the same, doesn't really matter. Let's, let's take them different functions, all right? And uh, it turns out there is a such thing in math. Mathematicians come up with an uh, operator, which is called uh, a joint operator, 
This A is a joint, a joint to A. So what's the relation between A with dagger and A? It turns out that once you have a joint operator, what you can do is this a joint operator can act on this function and then integr be integrated with uh, phi. So that would correspond to the integral where you have a joint operator acting on the psi. Uh, so that all star phi, right? So that's what I mean by this. And it turns out the fact that it's a joint means that this number, because the integral is a number, is equal to this number, where a just acts on phi. So that's the relation between a and a dagger. And uh, generally, if you have some operator, a, the joint operator can be something else. Okay, but just to make things simpler, because quantum mechanics is difficult by itself, all the properties, Hamiltonian, like corresponding to energy, there, right? Momentum, uh, angular momentum, all the properties we will study, it turns out that for all of them, the operators that correspond, they are so-called self-adjoint or Hermitian. So for them, A dagger and A are the same. Okay, And that is responsible for the fact that all the eigenvalues that are coming out of uh, operators involved in quantum mechanics, they are all real. That's another magical trick you can do with uh, algebra here to show that no matter what operator you take, if this is true, then all the eigenvalues that you uh, that you can get they're all real the complex part of this small a's is zero that's why they represent the results of the measurements right because results are always real they can be positive negative but they must be real so and that reality it comes from this fact there's a large temptation to show you that and it's essentially related to the fact that uh, if you say have, uh, it's actually very like two lines of proof, right? So if you have self-adjoint operator, and imagine you have a function which is an eigenfunction, right? Then this is what this is. Um, psi a psi because say we start with a function like this right and then this is equal to a essentially this is equal to a because say psi psi by like our initial condition we we've uh, we normalized the function and so it's already the psi times psi integral is one so this is A, this expression. We, we did this for the consideration of variation, right? Uh, and now the same thing can be written as like this, right? So when we introduce self-adjoint operator, which acts on psi, but on this side, on the, on the side of with, where we need to conjugate, right? And so then, if we know that self-adjoint operator means a dagger is the same as a, so we have a psi, psi, right? And this guy is equal to a psi, psi, right? But in order to take a from here, from this psi, you kind of take a, small a, out of the out of the conjugated quantity, right? And so what this means, this thing is equal to A star, essentially it's equal to A star psi, psi, right? And so what this system of equalities tells us 
is that A star and A, they are the same because we started from, the, from one statement and we uh, obtained the small a as a result. And with the system of equalities, we also showed that the same quantity is equal to A star, small a star, right? And the only way A star equals to A is when the complex part of A is, or imaginary part of A, is zero. So that's the proof that self-adjoint operators, or also they're called Hermitian operators, uh, they all have eigenvalues which can only be real, okay? Now going back here, you already can see that if our operator A is self-adjoint, then what we can do to prove this statement is that we introduce self-adjoint operator which is the same as A, acting on the psi. And so this is equal to this, right? And we know what this is. And the eigenvalue is real, so a small a star is the same as small a. So then we take it out. And this is average of, this is essentially the same as this, right? So we. I just proved you that this term is exactly the same as that in the situation when psi is an eigenfunction of A, right? So that means this commutator is zero. And so we just proved that zero is more or equal than zero, which makes sense, right? The same can be done if psi is an eigenfunction of B, right? and not eigenfunction of A. Any questions? All right, so that uh, kind of concludes the uncertainty principle. Okay. And so we will go to another exciting topic, which is now how to uh, how to find the how to find the dependence on time for the average properties like position, momenta, that sort of stuff. Okay, any questions? All right. Okay, so in this course, we've already talked about, okay, so, uh, we, we started with the time dependent Schrodinger equation, right? Okay. And we talked that if Hamiltonian is only space dependent, then we can solve time independent Schrodinger equation. And then the solution of time dependent Schrodinger equation uh, to solve this original problem, what we need is uh, initial conditions for the wave function given as a linear, uh, this, this is just a space function, right? And these guys, they form complete set, so you can always expand your uh, initial wave function at zero time as a linear combination of uh, eigenfunctions for your Hamiltonian, right? And that expansion is very useful because once you've done this, all you need to create uh, your time dependence of the wave function or to solve this equation is just to add, what should you add? Yeah. 
exponents. That's right. Okay. Solution of time-dependent Schrodinger equation of any kind. Three steps. Number one, number two, number three. Right. Of course, in the situation when the Hamiltonian is time independent. And that's the situation that we are mostly interested in the case of molecules, because in molecules, uh, the Hamiltonian is time independent. Then you can solve time independent Schrodinger equation, obtain the initial wave function that is absolutely necessary to solve any, time, any, any sort of uh, time dependent uh, differential equation. You need to know what's your start. And that's your start. It's it's given by the usually in the condition of the problem, right? So you need to know your start, and then the step number two is not knowing this. The step number two actually is expanding this function in linear combination of uh, solution of time independent equation. And once you've done that, once you obtain this coefficient c n, which are integrals of psi x zero, right, with the phi n stars, right, this norm, this typical integrals. Right, once you've done that, then you can just add these exponents, which you know because you know the both functions and energies, right? So then the step number three is the simplest. Just combine all the information you know, you know already, right? So that's the solution of time-dependent Schrodinger equation. Also, once you have a function psi, then we know we can, what can we do? We can predict the results of the measurements. We can predict what the average will be for those measurements, right? So essentially, if one other kind of, if you want just one quantity to characterize some property, that probably will be an average. And that average is psi that is time dependent, right? Uh, a psi, right? So that's the quantity. So operator, actually general operator, can depend also both on space and time. So far, we considered only operators that depend on space, right? But potentially, they can depend on time. So today, we'll consider. Today, what we're going to do, we're going to derive so-called equation of motion, or what's the time derivative of the average. Okay. Once you know this as some kind of function of t, right? Then you can solve the differential equation and obtain the evolution how the average will evolve in time. Okay, so that's the that's the value of this equation. That's why we're gonna do it, and it turns out it it's gonna give uh, lots of interesting stuff uh, once we obtain this equation. And obtaining this equation is really easy. All you need to know is how to differentiate, and just do it. Okay, so. Let's differentiate this average or this integral. Okay. Now, when it comes to differentiation of integrals, you probably don't know that, but essentially this is the case when the integral depends on parameter t. Okay. And we're lucky because in this situation t is just inside the integral. There is a more interesting case when t is, some, say, in the limit of the integration. It also can be handled, or we can also, math actually gives a prescription how to handle the situation where t is here and here. But in our case, t is only inside. And all we need is just to differentiate each integrand. And don't mind the integral, because the integral is over space. and time is only inside the integral, right? So we just go and differentiate inside the integral. Now, d over dt, total derivative of a 
is equal to uh, we will have essentially when you differentiate the product of three functions you get three terms right so because the differentiation of product of two functions you need to differentiate first leave the second plus there will be de derivative of the second times the first if you have three terms you will differentiate this leave those two plus you differentiate this leave those two plus you differentiate that one and you leave this one so, right so three terms uh, but it's like it's a little bit tedious but it's straightforward right so all you do all you do is then you differentiate this this is under star a psi then you have integral derivative of a psi plus right three terms now this one is the easiest because we can say right away that this is just average of a as its time dependence, right? So, and for most of our interesting cases, uh, a is not dependent on time, so this term will be zero. So if you put instead of a position, momentum, those are not functions of time. They, they are operators that do not depend on time. They depend on space, right? So this term usually is zero. Unless you have electromagnetic field where you have something that perturbs the system differently in different time. Uh, this is the easiest term. Now, these two can be handled using time dependent Schrodinger equation because time dependent Schrodinger equation already gives you the answer what the derivative of psi with respect to t is right so all you need to do is to put this there right so ih bar goes to the left so this term becomes this is the second easiest term this term becomes dx psi star a and we have h psi divided by h i h bar, right? So all I did is I moved the i h bar. Now let's make this expression a little bit nicer, so we can multiply. We can, yeah, we essentially can say that this is a constant. Let's just take it out of the integral, one over i h bar. The integral here is psi star a h psi this looks nice because this is pretty much like one over i h i h bar uh, average of a h okay so this is pretty compact now let's deal with this term this term more or less like this term is just it has uh, it has two complications one is well this star okay so it will change the sign of i when we apply it right so that's integral over dx and let's just carefully write it down it's gonna be h psi i h bar star a psi, okay? And uh, we again remove this, but now it's with minus integral the x h psi And the second complication is h kind of in the, in the place where we don't want it to be, right? So it's, it's better to have always operators in between two functions, right? 
Now we have an operator A acting on one function, operator A acting on another function. So uh, it would be nice to have a form like this where two operators in between the function, right? But now we know that all operators are Hermitian in quantum mechanics. That means that this can be considered as a self-adjoint operator that acts on the, uh, well, the function with the conjugation. But in reality, this is the same as the integral of uh, psi star h a psi because this is kind of one function. h was acting on another function, but uh, you can consider that h is actually h dagger, and then you move it. You can move it from the this part with the conjugation to the middle, right? And so that's that's the kind of. Uh, the mathematical justification for that move, okay? And then, what did we get? Uh, we have, in short, we can write this minus one i h bar, average of h a, okay? So we got all three terms figured out. This is the first term. This is the second term, and this is the third term. Now, you can see that uh, there, is a some, there is some resemblance between the first and third term. They have different signs, and they have different orders of H and A, right? So that backs for putting this in the form of commutator, right? Because average, it's like essentially, if you have H, A as a commutator, Average of the commutator is the same as average of H A minus A H. And this is the same as H A average minus average of H A A H, right? So averaging is just integrating, right? And integration is linear operation. So whatever you have as an integral, or like a, as an integrant, right? If you separate it by plus and minus signs, you can split it in uh, several integrals, and that's what happens here. So now we're going back from this form, from this form, going back to this form, which is more compact, right? So that's what's going on here. And uh, I can write down the final result. Final result will be Time derivative of A is equal to, so it's equal to minus 1 IH average of HA plus average over D over DT. Okay? This is nice expression. It can be even made nicer if you multiply by i the denominator and uh, numerator. So by i, i, right? And then uh, we will get rid of uh, essentially, we'll have minus 1 i, and 1 over h bar, right? So that's what happens here, so these two will give us minus one, this minus one will cancel this minus one, and we will end up with i divided by h bar, okay? So that's the algebra, and so d over dt for a is equal to i h bar, average of the commutator. plus this term, okay? Now, why is this so valuable and powerful? Because it can answer many qu interesting questions. Like for example, say we have a wave function, say, say okay, so say we have a wave function it evolves according to any wave function in quantum mechanics evolves according to time-dependent Schrodinger equation, right? Generally. So 
So say we have that going on for us, and we calculated average of uh, some property A, right? And the question now, if the property A doesn't depend itself on time, so this term is zero, so when do we have time derivative of the property A, uh, average of the property A, uh, zero? When do we have this zero? And if we have this zero, then it means that the property A, its average, doesn't change with time, right? So if, you, if there is no, essentially, one way to think about it, if you don't have speed, you are not going to move anywhere, right? Which is, of course, wrong, because you can have acceleration. But that's another story. But <laughs> in a simple case, when you don't have a speed and acceleration, then you're standing, right? So you're not moving anywhere. You don't change the opposition. Now, the same with this average property, uh, or average of the property A. If the time derivative is 0, that means uh, we don't have any change. The, the property is conserved, right? Which is nice, right? Because, well, everyone likes certain things to be conserved. Like, for example, you have some money you want them to conserve their value, right? So <laughs> you put them in a bank. And so the bank kind of helps you maybe with inflation or maybe with some perturbation in the country and blah, 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 right? So if, there, if you don't trust into the banks of this country, you go to the Swiss banks and so on and so forth. So conserved quantities are nice because you can predict what's going to happen. They're going to stay the same, right? So here, if we say calculated what's the average of position of the quantum particle was, what's the average? What is interesting from this equation is when the time derivative will be zero. And this equation tells you when this is going to happen. x itself doesn't depend on time, so this is always zero, so this term is zero. But now, what you need to consider is just this quantity, right? So it's a commutator of h with x. Is it 0? Why? Just a hunch. <laughs> OK, so all right, so what is H? Good. So what does any Hamiltonian operator? have in it. It's an energy it's a, it's an operator corresponding to energy and so how many energies do you know? At least two, right? Kinetic and potential. So then the commutator of H with X is essentially a sum of two commutators, T with X plus V with X. Now, v is a function of x, okay? So if you have any function of x and you multiply it by x, then you subtract x multiplied by the function. Uh, this is always 0, right? Because we can multiply function sine by cosine, by tangent, or in any order, right? So this, this is always true. Like, and if you have v, potential energy, as a function of x, then it's always going to commute. So what about this guy? The kinetic energy. Yeah. It won't commute. Why? T proportional to second derivative. 
And remember, T, kinetic energy, is the root of all the quantumness, all the weirdness, because the kinetic energy anymore is not just some momentum squared classical quantity. It's the second derivative, and that, that kind of the fact that the derivative doesn't commute with a function, you can, well, you can easily see that here. Uh, we calculated what the commutator is, uh, right? So it's non-zero because, because the result of applying second derivative to a function and the function multiplied by x, those are different, right? So any Hamiltonian will contain kinetic energy. Any kinetic energy will contain differentiation. Differentiation doesn't commute with the space variables, right? Unless differentiation is done along x and the variable is y, right? But, but if you have x and y, there will always be component of the x x component of the kinetic energy and y component of kinetic energy. So you are screwed, okay? Anyway, so it's, uh, this commutator will always be something, non-zero. Okay, so your hunch is wrong and uh, the commutator is non-zero with x for any Hamiltonian because of the kinetic energy. Okay, so that tells us that for any random function, you take any random function, psi, you calculate what's the average position of the particle. Turns out the time derivative of that average position will always be non-zero in general. So the particle will keep moving, which is not that surprising because the wave function is changing with time, according to time dependence on your equation. Why would the average position be uh, static, right? So if the wave function is changing in time, generally, probability density is changing with time, generally. And then, unless it's a stationary state, right? Unless it's a stationary state, the wave function and probability density will evolve in time and that means the average position should change in time. And that's what we see from this commutator. Now, of course, the trick is this equation talks about average, not the commutator. Right? So commutator can be non-zero, but average can be zero. Right? Potentially. Potentially. Right? So if you if simple example. You can have an operator d over dx, right? Or let's make it more interesting, second order, right? So second order, this is an, uh, say, operator. And uh, the operator is non-zero. It does something. It's, it differentiates twice, right? But the average of that operator with some function can be zero. And, uh, well, there is a simple function that, that will do this any ax plus b function, any linear function, if you differentiate it twice, it gives you zero. So if you do the averaging of this operator with linear functions, then, then take the integral, the integral will be zero. So depending on the function, the average can be zero, even though the operator itself is not zero, right? So commutator we established with a position is never going to be zero for any quantum system. But the average still can be zero. And one candidate for this is, of course, stationary states. How does this work? It turns out that if your wave function is an eigenfunction of the operator H, Right, so say this is the condition that is satisfied. Then if you calculate the average H A minus A H, that's the commutator. And it's non zero. 
but we already saw that in this situation, see, we, we consider that case where B was something. So in this case, B is A and A is H. All right. Sorry for the confusing notation, but essentially that's what this example was showing that if when we were considering the um, uncertainty principle in the situation where a wave function was an eigenfunction of one of the operators, we showed that the integral over this wave function with the commutator of two uh, operators, where one operator was an eigen operator for this function, then it's always going to be zero, right? So I can either repeat this or you can just uh, see this. Essentially, h psi will give us lambda psi, right? Uh, and we'll get, from this term, we'll get uh, average of a multiplied by lambda with minus sign. And then h is anti, oh, sorry, it's Hermitian or self adjoint operator, so it can act on this guy and produce lambda as well. And so then this term will be, again, average of a multiplied by lambda. And so since this is a number, this is a number, two numbers multiplied is a number with a minus sign plus same two numbers, right? So this is going to be 0. So the bottom line is if you are dealing with a stationary state, which is an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, then then in that, uh, in that case, your average of any operator is 0. Of course, considering that dA over dt is 0. Right? So if we have this, this is the first condition. And uh, this is our second condition. Then we have this. So any, any operator A, its time derivative of the average will be 0. This is kind of the second statement, the first one the first one let me just uh, clarify that dA over dt will be 0 if again dA over dt is 0 and uh, OK, so if we have an operator that commutes with Hamiltonian, the, the commutator is 0 for any function. And the operator is not time dependent, then average, of course, will be uh, time independent as well. Right? So this is the simplest case. And we just saw that for proposition, it doesn't work. Proposition will never give you 0 commutator. but what is A that you know will always satisfy that? And it's just staring at your face. You don't need to go anywhere beyond this part to see what A is. It's already written there. No. <laughs> Zero is not a property, right? So what would be the property of zero? <laughs> what, is, what is the operator that will always commute with the Hamiltonian? Yeah, Hamiltonian, that's right. So if A is H, then we're talking about average energy of the system. And it's not time dependent doesn't matter whether the function evolves in time or doesn't evolve or it's stationary function. 
the average energy will always be constant in time if the system is closed and that's the uh, type of systems we are considering in quantum mechanics, closed systems. That's why energy is conserved. And so it's, it's always, the time derivative always will be zero. Hamiltonian itself, of course, is kind of uh, time independent. That's for the closed systems is kind of truth. And uh, we have a conservation of energy. Now, the second case is when the Hamiltonian, sorry, when, the, when this condition is not satisfied, but instead of that, we're considering the wave function that is an eigenfunction of the Hamiltonian, then uh, you all also, because of this, because even though uh, the commutator is non-zero, but average of the commutator is zero, you always will have um, average of some property uh, conserved in time. And the condition, uh, like uh, example for this would be, say, it's very simple actually to give an example. You take particle in the box, you take any eigenstate of the particle in the box problem, right? Say ground state, and uh, and then calculate what the average position or momentum for this uh, function you have you can you can have right, and then you can consider time evolution. Uh, it's all going to be stationary because. If you consider this quantity, right, and you you need to put the time dependent function, say of the ground state, so this will this will be kind of the psi star part, then we'll have x and you will have psi part minus e. 1t phi 1x, where phi 1 is the square root of 2 divided by L sine pi x divided by L, right? So we, we just taken the first ground state of the particle in the box. It's an eigen function of the Hamiltonian. That's why by this general condition we should have no dependence on time for the average. And you can see it explicitly that uh, since x is not affecting time, then if you group two time-dependent factors, they have the two exponents, but with different signs in the exponents, so they kind of cancel each other, and you have no time dependence in the integral, right? No matter what the integral is, you have no time dependence. Time is gone because of that. Those two, those two factors kind of uh, cancel each other, okay? And the same will be with P or any other quantity. And the reason for that is that we are dealing with the stationary states. Uh, okay, so for them, if we average the commutator, it's always going to be zero. All right, now the third, the third last case, which is kind of very interesting. All right, so the third case. which is interesting to consider is a situation where say we have an eigenfunction of A, right? Have an eigenfunction of A and we also have no time dependence of A, okay? And the question is, well, according to the same logic as with the Hamiltonian here, if we consider time de if full time derivative of average of A on this function, then it will be zero. From this, we'll have this. Because it really doesn't matter whether we do this consideration uh, with the 
wave function that is an eigenfunction of Hamiltonian, or we do it with a wave function that is an eigenfunction of A, the commutator, if a wave function is an eigenfunction for one of those operators, will always be zero. Okay, by the same, the logic is exactly the same. You just apply, in this case, would be A applying on psi here will give us small a, and there will be average of h. And here, a applying on, the, on this side will give us small a, and then we subtract two numbers from each other. They're exactly the same. So this is the case, all right? Now, now what, what this kind of uh, tells us is that if we, now the practical chemical example, if we consider chemical reaction, right? Say proton transfer in malon, uh, malon uh, uh, dialdehyde, right? So we have structure like this, and we are talking about, all right? So we are talking about, yeah, that's the structure. Right, and we're talking about uh, transfer of hydrogen here, and then we're getting kind of the second minimum. This is something I was showing you before. Right, so we, we have a kind of a two minima corresponding to hydrogen being with one oxygen or hydrogen being with another oxygen. And uh, there is a barrier, of course, to leave the oxygen and go to another one uh, of potential energy, right? Now, how is this all applicable? I'll tell you in a moment. So say A, A will be operator that is defined in the following way. It's a heavy side function. So the operator is essentially, z say this is the center of the barrier, right? An operator is zero function up to this, uh, uh, let's put the coordinate system so that the zero corresponds to the uh, place where operator becomes one. And before zero in all negative axis, so this is x, x, like a chemical reaction coordinate, right? So here the operator is zero when x is in the range from minus infinity to zero. And it's one where x is within range, um, say, not including zero and um, plus infinity, All right? So this is our operator. How do we study chemical reaction with it? Very simple. Uh, we have a wave function, okay? And if the wave function is in the negative side, so then operator acts on it. It gives us, if it's an all in negative side, it multiplies by zero, right? Times the wave function. So it's an eigenfunction of the operator. Now, if it's in a product side, then again, A operates on the psi. If the whole psi is in a positive range, then A doesn't do anything. It multiplies by one, right? Nice. So this is a kind of a product function, and this is a reactant function. Both are eigenfunctions of A. So for, for the function, for any random function psi, to be an eigenfunction of A, it either needs to be all localized in the reactant well, or all localized in the product well, right? And the reactant and product well are separated by barrier, and the, the condition is very simple. You, you need to have everything inside from zero to infinity for the product well, or from zero to minus infinity for the reactant well, right? So now, if we consider average of this, say we started with the reactant wave function, and it's an eigenfunction of A, and by these conditions, A, as you can see, it's time independent operator. So this condition is satisfied. This condition is satisfied because we started with reactant wave function. It's an eigenfunction with small a equals zero. We'll get, the, uh, we'll get out of these two conditions that average 
average uh, of this operator is not going to be time dependent. So reaction will never happen. Which contradicts to, of course, reality that tells us if we start with uh, reactant, it will go over the product into the products, right? It may take some time, but it will happen. So what is wrong here with this logic? So that's, uh, I do not expect anyone to answer right away. Uh, this is something you can think at home. And tell me next lecture, okay?